730, David Hartman, Denise Shimano is with us. Jones on assignment today. Probably no words in our language are more frightening than these words. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. But what do we really know about this awful disease? What's it like to have it? What's it like to treat it? In this half hour, we're going to start a special report on AIDS, how it is spread, how it can be prevented, how it is treated. We're going to help you separate the myths, and there are many about this disease, from the realities of it. And if you are heterosexual, how worried should you be about the possibility of contracting AIDS? We will tell you today and all this week. before eight right now most of us know by now that AIDS is a deadly disease it's killing young people by the thousands now, many people believe that it infects only homosexual men or people who live in remote parts of Haiti this is absolutely not true not anymore the disease is spreading heterosexual men women even children are now getting this disease and the numbers are frightening this is being called the epidemic of the century and for now, those that get the disease will die. All this week, we are going to try to teach you more about AIDS so you'll be able to help prevent the spread of it to you and your loved ones. You will learn what to fear, what not to fear, and you will be taught by people who have AIDS and the doctors and nurses and other professionals who treat them. For us, this education was remarkable. It was inspiring. It was also terribly sad. We met some of the finest people we have ever met. Some sick, some are healers. All of them at Montefiore Hospital in the North Bronx part of New York City. Dr. Azar, 8818-818-818. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of dying. We're not curing people, but we're certainly helping them. If you compare what's happened with AIDS from 1981 to now, compared to virtually any other illness that we know about, the amount we've accomplished is staggering. It's a disease which keeps on attacking. It, it doesn't give much rest to the people. And the problems are overwhelming. I thought they were wrong. You know, I just couldn't understand how I caught the virus. How afraid were you? Extremely afraid. I mean, you know, this virus is no joke. And uh, since then, I've been in the hospital constantly with different infections. These are young people who know what their fate is, we know what the outcome is going to be, and the remarkable courage of most of the patients and their will to live, it's just, it's very inspiring. These people have been brought together by AIDS. Some suffer from it, some are trying to treat it, and all of them are fighting to understand it. Around 27,000 people in our country have been diagnosed with what's called full-blown AIDS. More than half of them are dead. The rest are dying. About two million Americans are infected with the AIDS virus, and most don't even know it. They have no symptoms of disease. Yet, it's not known when or if they ever will. So very little is known, really. The face of AIDS is frightening, but many of our worst fears are based on misunderstanding or are just plain wrong. So how can you actually get AIDS? The doctors who know say not, and I repeat not, by casual contact with someone who's infected with the AIDS virus. Not through handshakes, not uh, through shared plates and cups or forks or spoons, uh, not from hugging each other. In fact, not even from sleeping next to each other in the same bed. This is AIDS virus infected blood. The only way you can actually get the disease is if this blood were to mix with your blood or other body fluids. And there are only three ways that can happen. Through sexual contact, sexual intercourse, either homosexual or heterosexual. Through shared, unsterile, hypodermic needles. That's why drug users can get it. And finally, a mother can give it to her unborn child, uh, either intrauterine or when the baby actually passes through the birth canal. This is a very hard disease to catch, and that, of course, makes it easier to prevent. Hector Muniz wishes he had known. For a period of time, he abused drugs, shared needles, and got AIDS. I've been in the hospital constantly, like I said. I mean, this has been like my regular home days. I've only had periods of a week, two weeks, maybe outside and back in the hospital. It's been very, very difficult to deal with this 
fire. How do you deal with it? How do you maintain hope? We have to keep some kind of sense of hope to try to continue and fight it. And maybe something in the future might come that might, you know, better the situation. But if you give up sooner than that, then you're already giving up on yourself, Dave. I mean, you have to have hope. Anna has the AIDS virus in her blood, too, but no symptoms of the disease yet. She got it sexually from her husband, who died of AIDS. Her baby may have it, too. It's too soon to tell. Well, I try to think positive, and um, I have hope that uh, she'll outgrow that. And I figured I've made my life. If anything would happen to me, fine, but she's just a baby. She doesn't know. I wouldn't want her to live like that for the rest of her life. How afraid are you for you? Uh, pretty much. <laughs> uh, it's hard. I'm trying to think positive. I haven't gotten sick till now. And uh, I try to eat well, maintain myself in pretty good health, and just hope for the best. Both these people are young, and both are very scared. They've been dealt a bad card, and one of them is now dying. The other's future is unsure. Their care is in the hands of a remarkable team of medical professionals. Dr. Gerald Friedland, Dr. Robert Klein. They had a group of doctors, nurses, social workers, lawyers, all devoted to making the lives of AIDS patients better, all volunteering for a battle that, for now, cannot be won. It would be something that would be impossible to do alone if it weren't for all my colleagues doing the same thing and, and us supporting each other. It would be an impossible task. It's a self-selected group of people who have chosen to work on this issue. So there's a sense of commitment and mission that ties everybody together. And of course, if you feel you're helpful to someone, that gives you a sense of worth and a sense of, of that, that your, your life has some meaning. So I think those are the main reasons why, he, why we do it. This team of professionals and these patients you will learn more about this week. They are our teachers. They want you to know that this is a disease we can no longer afford to ignore. If the predictions are accurate, then we're quantitatively really, in a sense, at the beginning of this epidemic, not nearly through it. All right. If you want more information about AIDS, you can contact your state or local health department, or you can call the AIDS hotline number 1-800-342-2437. 1-800-342-2437. And tomorrow through Friday, every day this week, we will continue this report with this phenomenal group of people uh, you just met briefly. You will get to know them a lot better this week. And we'll be right back after this, four minutes off. Nine minutes before eight right now. Perhaps some of us used to take some cold comfort that only certain kinds of people could get AIDS. In part two of our series on AIDS, we look at the growing evidence that no one really is exempt from this disease. They're called high-risk groups, the people who get AIDS in the greatest numbers. In this country, 90% are men, most of them homosexuals. Drug abusers are next. The sharing of unsterilized intravenous needles is spreading this deadly virus. And then there are select populations, Haitians mostly, many of whom brought the infection to this country. These groups have borne the brunt of this epidemic, but don't be misled. AIDS has moved well beyond them. People have to understand that this is not a disease of a, of a few restricted groups that we can ignore. It's really a problem for us as a whole people. This disease is no respecter of persons. It's a virus. It's not a massive epidemic that's going to decimate the country, but it is a major problem. We can't ignore it. It's not going to go away. We've got to do everything we can to prevent the numbers from increasing in the best way we know how. Here's a cold, hard fact for you. Right now, one out of every 100 Americans has actually been infected with the AIDS virus. Now, they're not all actually sick yet. In fact, doctors aren't sure how many will get the full-blown AIDS disease and die. But as of right now, 27,000 Americans have died of AIDS or are dying of AIDS. By 1991, within five years, it's expected that 10 times that many, 270,000 Americans, will have been diagnosed with full-blown AIDS. 
heterosexual, homosexual, a male, female, the disease is no longer taking sides. You can't measure the amount of suffering and pain and sorrow that uh, that is enveloped in that larger number. We just can't conceive of it. It's easier to deal with it on an individual basis. And I can tell you that dealing with individual patients, this is a very cruel disease in human history. One individual we got to know is a carrier of the AIDS virus and a new mother. She got it from her husband, who died of AIDS. Now she is infected, contagious, but hasn't actually got the symptoms of the disease herself. We called her Anna. There are two million carriers like her. Her baby may be infected as well. It's too soon to know. I've been a carrier now for about a year. I've been fine so far. What's the worst part of all of this? The thought that you might get sick and you might die. <laughs> and especially having a baby. Uh, I just became a mother. That's my first child, my only child. And the thought that I might not be able to see her grow up. How much do you cry? I've cried a lot and, you know, you could only shed with so many tears. And when I'm alone, I break down. But if you do develop it, you know you're going to die and there's nothing that could be done about it. And just the waiting period, it's pretty hard. Um, what is the prognosis, let's say, on someone like Ann? We don't know. There may be a lifelong risk. And it may be that the majority of people will go on to full-blown AIDS. But at this point in time, the information that we have indicates that most people do not. The good news is that she's been stable and hasn't progressed. And the longer uh, we see that, you know, the better her prognosis will be in the future. But she could have uh, anywhere from a uh, 10 to 30 percent chance of uh, developing AIDS itself over the next several years. For now, Anna can lead a normal life, but her health will be constantly monitored by the staff at Montefiore Medical Center. Her future and her baby's future are uncertain. She must live with that and with her fear of rejection. How many people at work know? Nobody. Nobody. Hmm. Why don't you tell them? It's not something people take lightly. You tell them uh, you're an AIDS carrier right away. It's like you have AIDS. You know, let's stay away from that person. I've known people to even lose their jobs, lose family. They won't listen. It's like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to take any chances. So. People are frightened. I think that a lot of the reaction and hysteria is understandable. It shouldn't be condemned. It should be understood and dealt with by educating people. People are frightened, and they have very good reason to be frightened. They're misinformed, and they're concerned. Attitudes that people have had of stigma toward the patients who contract this disease or the attitudes of exclusion really are inappropriate, especially, of course, since we have really confirmed, I think, any number of times now that it is not contracted by casual contact. What are the hopes right now that you might someday, thanks to you know medicine science, be able to get rid of this virus and go back to living a normal life? There's no actual hope right now, but um, we just got to try to think positive, but as far as any breakthrough right now, they have none. And uh, maybe there won't be one for me, but in the future, I hope they do find one for others. Anna's future is uncertain. Tomorrow, we'll meet a man who has AIDS and his family. They want us to understand through their example of the disease and the toll it takes. And if you want more information about AIDS right now, you can contact your state or local health department or you can call this toll-free number 1-800-342-2437. Ten minutes of eight right now. Hector Muniz is a man we got to know and like very much. He has AIDS and he is very sick, but his spirit remains wonderfully strong uh, he made the mistake of abusing drugs for a short time in his life, sharing needles, becoming infected with the AIDS virus, and then long after he had kicked the drugs, had a good job, new child, he got AIDS. Few AIDS patients are willing to be interviewed on television, but Hector was. He wants you to know him, he wants you to know his family better, and through him, to understand this disease and the real human toll that it takes. And we thank you for that, Hector. Don't worry, man. Things are going to get better for all of us. I'm sure they will. You know? When I see you go home and you 
angry and you start crying at you. Like, Ma, calling you back and just hugging you to make you feel much better. I hate to see you crying and suffering. You know, I really do. You're going to get better. You've got to keep fighting, that's all. What can you tell me about this gentleman we're going to go see? He's 31 years old. And he had the diagnosis of AIDS made in December of 1985. So that's what, not quite a year ago, 10 right. months ago. Right. Has he been in the hospital a lot? Many times. This was the day we first met Hector, walking into a corner room on the seventh floor of the hospital wing. Yes. Hector? Like yes. most AIDS patients, he was very young and very sick, and at this stage, in constant need of medical attention. It was not a good day for Hector, but we came on other days, on better days, and talked to the people who care for him. We felt their frustration and saw Hector's tremendous need. We were beginning to learn. If the goal here is to cure the patient, you're going to fail. But if the goal is to provide a, a measure of quality of life for the duration of time that that individual may have, arranging the care in such a way so that the person gets what he or she needs in order to cope with this, final illness, if that's what your goals are, then they're achievable. The, the goal is not to keep them alive indefinitely, but to take the time that's left and make it as valuable as possible. I just try to be pretty positive, Dave. There's nothing else. What can we do? I don't want to die. I don't really want to die with my newborn baby. And No, you can't do that. You have to have hope. I mean, it's hard. I've had my bad days. But I always try to keep a peppy attitude because if your mind is in a positive state of mind, then physically you feel better. To what extent can any of us who don't have AIDS really understand what you're going through? Uh, you know, everyone claims that they do and, and they'll stay on one side and they say, well, hang in there, don't get weak, but it's very, very difficult. No one that does not have AIDS can really, really understand the hurt that an AIDS patient might be holding inside. Uh, what do you answer them? You know, I don't know what to tell them. It's all right. Just swallow. I usually swallow hard and say, uh, keep your face. I can't tell them not to worry. I can't tell them it's going to be all right when we don't know. She's a very honest woman. And she's a deeply caring woman. Deeply caring for uh, her son and her husband her whole family and she's in a lot of pain and I think she's handling it awfully well. I really do. Monty Callan works harder than most people I know. At times of crisis, entire families need help and that support is a critical part of AIDS patient care at Montefiore Medical Center. You know, Ada, it's really too much for any one person to be on 24-hour duty, 24 hours, day after day. At some point, you have to have a break. When he's better, when he's better that I see than I feel. That you can leave. Then I can leave and that I feel confident. Mm -hmm. Then I'll leave. After spending a week with AIDS patients, their families, and the team that helps them cope, I am overwhelmed. Overwhelmed at the talent and caring of the medical team and at how really sick these people are who have AIDS. This disease is deadly. Curiously, it is also extremely hard to catch. But if you do, you're in deep trouble. Oh, I don't have it. No, I feel that I do don't have it because I feel good. John does have AIDS. You can hear it in his voice, the congestion, the confusion. He and his lover, David, are both infected. They appeared in shadow because it gave a feeling of security, of anonymity. John denied the seriousness of his illness because it gave him hope and strength. Denial is a wonderful, wonderful defense mechanism. We couldn't live if we didn't deny a lot of the terrible things around us. Patients use that all the time. How many times have you said, why me? Why? Oh, Dave. Many times I've done that. I, I really, I, it's really hard to accept. I've been very angry a, a lot of times because I, I don't, I, I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but I just, I, I don't think it was fair for me. It was not fair for me because I haven't been a bad fellow, you know. Fortunately, I really don't care how they look at me. 
I know, and that's important to me. You know, and as long as my family is still supportive to me, and my public and my neighborhood, I'm going to be just fine, baby. The remarkable courage and their will to live, and uh, it, it's just, it's very inspiring. How much do you cry? A, a fair amount. Uh, I haven't yet accepted the fact, in spite of what I told you, that young people should die prematurely of this miserable disease. Tomorrow we'll introduce you to the incredibly dedicated, committed team, led one of the leaders as the man you just saw there, Dr. Friedland. This team of doctors and other healthcare professionals who treat patients with AIDS and their families. Uh, if you would like more information about AIDS, you can contact your state or local health department. You can also call this number 1-800-342-2437. 1-800-342-2437. And uh, Hector, your Mets won the World Series. That's great. Right now, we'll be back four minutes up. Quarter of eight right now. In the past few days, we've told you something about AIDS, what it is, how it's spread. We've met people who have the disease, people who may get it. Uh, this morning, we'd like you to meet a group of people, doctors, nurses, social workers, and others at uh, Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx in New York City. These are the people who actually care for the AIDS patients and their families, really care for them. Besides their professional skills, each of these people is a personal model of courage, of commitment, and compassion. Can I breathe again? Caring for a dying patient is a complicated thing. It begins with medicine, but requires so much more. Who helps the family cope? Who is there just to talk to? The needs are emotional, psychological, even legal. So it takes a team to make their lives better, a remarkably dedicated team of caring people. We watch them work. Are you going through so much? Are you really going through a lot? The thing I'm concerned about, too, is your lack of rest. A few deep breaths. I always shake hands with the patient, and I will often hold on. And I think patients like to be touched not just AIDS patients but it's a very human thing and it connects you with the patient in a very human not necessarily technical medical way hands-on patient care family care is only part of this medical team's focus there's research to be done studies by Pat Call and Diana Maud trying to chart the spread of this disease who's getting it and how numbers of patients multiplied by the numbers they had contact with, testing the children of AIDS, mothers or fathers, following the bloodlines, literally, to see if this virus is spreading. Their work is proving, finally, how hard this deadly disease is to catch. Throughout the week, these professionals meet in small groups, keeping each other aware of patients' conditions and needs. Once a week, they all meet together, psychiatrist, lawyer, nurse, social worker, doctor, a wealth of knowledge and experience and caring brought to each AIDS patient. We're not prepared for young people to die. and We're not prepared to see mothers and fathers burying their sons and daughters. I mean, it's, everyone expects their parents to die. Nobody expects the children to die. We may not cure, but I think we can do enough that we can feel rewarded, uh, feel that we're accomplishing something, although in the end, we lose the patient. I think our patients are people and our family members. And I think we get to know them that way. We get to know them in their joy and their pain and their caring, their love. All of us here are here because we want to. And uh, it's been wonderful to be part of that team. What's the most important thing each of you uh, can provide for a patient and or the patient's family? Being there, someone to talk to, to, to touch, to be around. And what these patients need more than anything else, I agree, is to appreciate that people are not going to abandon them. When people express despair when initially hearing the diagnosis, uh, the thing I try to tell them is, you know, we're not going to give up. We're going to work with you. We'll help you where we can, and we'll be with you. Anyone who works with dying people uh, has to walk a very fine line. They have to get close enough to their patients to feel, to care, to understand, but not so close that they can't get their jobs done. The tremendous 
grief, the suffering, can be overwhelming. And when that happens, as it must sometimes, then the doctors, the nurses, the social workers also need help. Here, they get it from each other. You have concerns and fears and depression and loss, grief, that you have to share with someone. They go through the same thing and understand, and because you don't have to bring all of it home. But you do bring some of it home, the frustration, the loss. For Dr. Robert Klein and the other AIDS team members, the concerns have run even deeper. Were their families being exposed to the virus through them somehow? The evidence now says no, but at the beginning, fears were very real. How do I live with this terror? And my way of living with it was simply not to think about it very often. And to try to look at the facts. It certainly is contagious, but it's in a very, in very well-defined ways. And I just kept, you know, every fact that was reassuring, I certainly latched on to. The hard thing for many people to understand is despite it being a terrible disease, it's quite difficult to catch, and it, it's communicable in only well-defined ways. I feel, despite the frustration and the hard work, a tremendous sense of accomplishment. I think that what our group has done in terms of caring for patients and adding to the knowledge about this disease is tremendously important. Have you ever lost your enthusiasm for it in any way? <laughs> Not more than three or four times an hour. <laughs> There's good humor in this group, and good heart, and a degree of commitment that's uncommon. We just began to get a sense of that, the hard work, the pain, and the hopes they share with their patients. Hopes for a better tomorrow, shared every day, and for a long time to come. I don't know what's around the corner, and if I really thought it was a disaster and all bleak, I couldn't turn the corner and face tomorrow. I really think that that there will be answers and treatments and hopefully cures, um, and hopefully soon. I wish you could meet these people. They are really special. If you want more information about AIDS, contact your state or local health department. You can also call 1-800-342-2437. That's 1-800-342-2437. Uh, when we come back, uh, Dr. Tim Johnson with an update on research and is a cure in sight. All this week we've been talking about AIDS and our medical editor Dr. Tim Johnson joins me now for some perspective on where we actually are in fighting this terrible disease. Tim, how appropriate is all the media attention AIDS has been getting lately? I think it's very appropriate, David, because AIDS is really unique. Number one, it is invariably fatal, and number two, it is growing exponentially throughout the world um, beyond control, at least currently. It is really now a pandemic, meaning that it is to be found on all the continents of our world. And I can't think of any disease, uh, certainly in recent history, that combines those two characteristics. All right, there's been a lot of talk lately about a drug called AC, AZT. Right. What are the expectations? What will it do? What won't it do? And what, what's We don't know the answers to any of those questions over the long run. Obviously, the news was good enough in the short run to bring it now to the uh, attention of certain AIDS victims and come December or January on a wider scale. Uh, it's the first real ray of hope we have had in the treatment of this disease. Notice I studiously avoid the word cure, but at least right. in the control of it. But I think we'll need many more months of experience before we know how effective it is over the long run and how toxic it might prove to be over the long run. What about, what are the hopes in terms of some kind of vaccine? I mean, we have polio vaccines and mm -hmm. flu vaccines and so forth to prevent it. Well, that's the great hope, of course, right now, and everybody is guessing as to when such a vaccine might be possible. I'm personally quite pessimistic about a vaccine in the near future, at least. That virus can change. I think it's going to take a while. I don't see a vaccine around the corner by any means. What about people's uh, obvious fears of getting this disease, other ways of protecting themselves. Well, you know, we need to remember that any individual can indeed avoid the disease by individual choices and behavior. Now, we're a little more pessimistic about what might happen on a societal basis, and rightly so, when it comes to controlling sexual behavior or other kinds of behavior. But every individual has within his or her grasp right now the decision-making ability to avoid this disease by changing sexual behavior and doing certain other things to avoid the risk factors that we all know about. Needles and sterilized Absolutely. needles. So needles every individual them. ought to be very hopeful about what they can do. What we worry about is what society might do. Tim, thank you. Thank you, David. And we'll be right back. 
51 after now, all week long at this time, we have been bringing you David's series of reports on AIDS. Today, how to keep yourself and your family safe and what the future might hold. How do people get AIDS? It's only just beginning. Small groups meeting to talk about AIDS, to teach young people, to train volunteers. They're all concerned, deeply concerned, about the explosive spread of the AIDS virus and what you and I can do to help those in need and to protect ourselves from this deadly disease. Limit the number of sexual contacts when having sex. Decrease, whenever possible, the exchange of body fluids. And don't use drugs. It's the unsterile injection of drugs that transmits this infection, not the drugs themselves. And we have to consider making needles available, sterile, uncontaminated to individuals. This is a catastrophic epidemic and we need really to consider our priorities. An educated individual is the best protected individual I can think of. There's one person here today who has a friend or family member who knows someone reasonably close who's sick with AIDS. If we had the same meeting a year from now, there will be three or four of you. This was an informal session at John F. Kennedy High School in New York. A teacher, and a doctor talking about AIDS and learning what concerns these students the most. A lot of teenagers today are just, just think it's a whole big joke and don't take it seriously at all, but it's something that's really killing a lot of people. A couple of weeks ago, we had something called Crack Week where we spent one day in school and they just drilled into our head that crack is bad, crack is wrong, crack is addictive. And I don't even want to hear the word crack. And I know everything there is to know about crack. And I mean, if we were to do that about eight, I mean, yeah, it'd be long, kids would be bored, but I think that they'd hear things and they'd know what kind of a problem it is. You can't deal with statistics all the time. A bunch of numbers don't explain to you how you actually get it. It don't tell you how you might get it or what might happen to you. Because everybody believes they're not in that statistic. Nobody believes they're going to get AIDS. The only prevention is going to be effective education uh, providing people who need protection in, in their sexual intercourse, the means of that protection, the knowledge about what works and what doesn't, and if they need those condoms, those condoms have to be given out as we're doing in our drug treatment program at this point. Uh, very dramatic things when, when, when we can't even get past a discussion of whether it's okay to have sex education in schools or not. Important efforts are beginning. This is a scene from an AIDS education film made for viewing in the school system. And this is a group of methadone patients, former drug users speaking to intravenous drug users about the risk of AIDS. The teaching is beginning, and hopefully the spread of the virus can be stemmed. But what about all those people already infected? We've got a problem. We should prepare to deal with people that are ill in massive numbers, and the states where most AIDS has occurred are doing that. The numbers are staggering, 270,000 infected by 1991, 56,000 new cases that year alone. The current health care community cannot cope with this much illness, with this many dying people. So volunteers are now being trained, like this group meeting at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. The hope is that they can help with the social and personal needs of these AIDS patients and their families. And everywhere, hospices like this one at Beth Abraham in New York, will be in great demand. Places for terminally ill patients to die with dignity. In San Francisco, a model program is getting more attention. Andrew Finocchio has AIDS and lives at home. He's happier here, more at ease, and his care comes to him. When he needs it, a nurse arrives to check his physical condition. Medicine can be sent, and social workers stop by to talk, to comfort and to provide the support so many AIDS patients are denied. There are things that anybody can do uh, to help someone in trouble, and people with AIDS are just people like you and me, and they're in trouble, and they need help. It's heartening to know that all over the country people are getting involved and pulled into this AIDS issue and working on it and at lots of different levels. And, and from the basic biology to the clinical manifestations of the psychosocial issues so that there's been a response and I think for the first time in a long while we have something to be able to say that there is reason to be optimistic about the future. Obviously the educational effort is what's critical. There's a number you can call 1-800-342-2437 1-800-342 AIDS. We'll be right back.
Additional...